And I was fortunate enough to make Team Canada, we won gold medal. And then you get drafted to the Leafs, and then you're playing in the NHL. All in that 18-year-old year that Ray and I would have started when you're 18. So that is just a blur. Eight, 18 years of age. Like you're, you're still three years too young to drink in the States. So you got fake ID playing. I was actually 19 in Boston in 1979. Were you 19? Well, I was turning 19 in December. Okay, so you're old. You're old. <laughs> my actually first first time I got my centerman traded. We're playing in Boston, first game of the year. My centerman's Billy Gallego. First time I played forward, I was a defense my whole life. And at the end of this game, they called Billy Gallego in. He got traded for Tom Fergus. At the end of the game, Tom Fergus came back in the plane with us. Billy Gallego stayed in Boston. <laughs> and you didn't like, not like today, where you get to go home and pack and say goodbye and send letters and faxes and, and move on. You just like stayed. And, and I remember uh, Billy Gallego's wife meeting the team in Buffalo with his clothes. <laughs> that, that, that was kind of how it was. So I got my first centerman as a forward traded in, in Boston. And the first time I played against Ray, actually, I think we played each other in exhibition. And, and uh, I was spotting in on defense because there was probably a few fights going on, so we were missing a few players. So I was finishing the game on defense. So Ray comes down one-on-one, -on -one, threw the legs out, in goal. And I looked at my agent in the corner and goes, thank gosh, we're a forward. <laughs> <laughs> First one-on-one -on -one with the best defenseman in the NHL. It didn't turn out that way. <laughs> I don't remember that. I, mean, I think I've never scored a goal like that. Other than maybe Pee-wee hockey. But, uh, no, I just, uh, you know what? Uh, I think we're both very lucky to, to come in with, uh, you know, the original six teams. Um, you know, the tradition, the history, the passion of the fans, the buildings that we played in. Um, you know, I, I still remember uh, going to Maple Leaf Garden or, you know, Chicago Stadium or the Montreal Forum. I played one game in the Olympia, I was lucky enough. At first, my rookie year, I scored a goal against the Jim Rutherford, and the only one I played there. Um, so I, I got to play in all the original 16, Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, when you're drafted by uh, one of those teams, um, you feel it, you feel it really way. You know, you walk into the dressing room, uh, the organization, uh, just a long history. And, and being a hockey fan, you know, uh, you know, you know all of these teams. So, uh, very fortunate uh, for me to end up with one of those teams where I was lucky enough to, to play almost 21 years in Boston. And it's still my home today. But even though I left for 15 months to play Colorado and live an amazing experience there winning the cup, my last game played uh, was phenomenal. Um, my time in Boston was just, you know, I never, ever, ever thought I would never leave there. And I just left to win a cup, but, uh, you know, I'm still living there, and my kids live there, and it's uh, just an amazing place uh, for me to, to end up. I was very fortunate and lucky to, to end up there. Actually, my, my you know, I could have I been in LA. They, uh, <coughs> I was drafted eight overall by the Bruins, but that was that was LA's pick. They traded Ron Graham to uh, to the uh, to the Kings for their first round pick. And I, and I asked Harry Simmons, "How did you get that pick?" And so the Bruins had like you know Jeremy Chambers still there, and then they got a couple other goalies, and they had signed Ron Graham, who was MVP of the WHA or something. And uh, so LA calls, and back then, you know, the GMs, they drank pretty heavily. <laughs> so he gets a call from the uh, LA GM, and he's feeling pretty good, and he wants Ron Graham. And Harry tells him that there's really nobody on your roster that I really want. He says, I thought about a first round pick. I might think about it, but Ron Graham was MVP. We got big plans for him. And you know, we don't really see him going anywhere. He says, uh, I'll call you back. So the GM's with this owner, and they keep drinking, and they call back like two hours later, and they're really feeling good now. Mm -hmm. And they're like, 
we're going to give you a first round pick for Ron Graham. He says, ah, I don't know. I'm going to have to sleep on it. So he gets off the phone. He calls Tom Johnson, his assistant GM. He says, we just got a freaking first round pick for Ron Graham. And <laughs> 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 See, kids, don't drink. <laughs> so, uh, big night in the NHL tonight. Connor Bedard, guys, he's only, what, a year or two older than you kids. He's making playing his first preseason game, first overall pick. Uh, first overall pick again, protect him, high pedigree. Wendell, you were first overall in 85. Uh, did the Leafs make any attempt to protect you? I'm thinking of an inter squad game with Big Daddy, maybe. Yes, a little, little different today. My first two fights in the NHL were the Leafs tough guy. Day two and day three, of, or day two of training camp. I was uh, in training camp. I got warned. Jim Benny and I had the same agent, and and he said he called his agent uh, Donnie Bean and said, "Big Daddy Bob McGill is going to go after Wendell tomorrow." And, and Donnie didn't. Well, I guess he'll have to handle himself. And, and so that next day, I had my first fight in the NHL, and then there's a second fight next shift right after that one. Because back then you had a fight, you picked up your stuff, you lined up, stood right beside the guy again. So then it happens again. And so my first two fights were our team tough guy. And, and I remember telling Big Daddy, because all the tough guys, and Ray would have watched this for you, you get all the game notes, now it's all technology, but it was a piece of paper, and all the tough guys would go down penalty minutes, see who's on the other team, who's got to, what they got to do, who they're going to play against. So he just went down my penalty minutes list. He, didn't, he, he went by the first overall pick list. He just went down the penalty minute list, and so that was my, my first and my second two fights in the NHL were Marty McSorley in exhibition. So I had, you know, first overall, I didn't see Austin Matthews fight anybody. <laughs> Mario didn't, but uh, um, I wasn't. I wasn't very. I wasn't very bright, so I kept fighting. But uh, as, as Ray was saying, the original six is probably as, as a player that plays on energy. It's probably the best places to play is in the original six because you can smell. The, you walk into the rink and you can smell hockey 24/7 in those buildings, and the fans are in. Whether it's a Tuesday night or a Saturday night, the fans are on top of it and in the game. So as an emotional player, it's fun. You're in the game because it's not the players that get players in the game. It's the building. Whether you're really hated. Like if we played in Chicago, or if you're really liked when you're playing at home. And energy players thrive on that. Like I like Darcy Tucker, I played with him in Tampa, then I got to play with him in Toronto and watched him in Toronto. He was twice as good in Toronto as he was in Tampa. Because he got to play in the atmosphere and the energy and he thrived off of it. And he was a better player. Where you're, you're playing some nights where it's not the main thing in town. And there's 6,000 fans, you're barely trying to get in the game. And it's if you don't really self-motivate, those are long nights in a lot of cities, but when you play in the original six, every night is a big night. You're going into Boston, little tiny rink, Ray Borg's playing 40 to 45 minutes a game. What was your average? Like 14. Yeah, but you average like 14 shots a game. You can shoot for the red line. I had 19 shots one game. That was my Anyways, you're playing. I'm talking about 70, 73 shots on that that night. I had 19. And the score ends up 3-3, and all our team go taps his pads. <laughs> He's playing for the other team. <laughs> but what Clark is saying is like, but you know what, you're, like some, some people that can't play in Boston, like, you know, we have, it, we have it for hockey, baseball, football, basketball. The fans are really demanding, and, and when I hear, oh, that town wasn't made for that athlete. Really? Are you freaking kidding me? Don't you want to play in a town that is so passionate about their sports that they expect good stuff? And don't you expect good stuff out of yourself? Like nobody would criticize, nobody would be tougher on myself than myself. You know, I knew when I stunk. And if I stunk, you know, yeah, once in a while, I freaking deserve to hear about it, right? But some of these players sometimes, it's like you hear, oh, he wasn't made for Boston. Or he wasn't made for Toronto. It's like, come on, buddy. We're playing Tampa, right? <laughs> <laughs> did you guys, okay, did you ever have a coach that wasn't made for you? I, my first, my rookie year, right? They, 
They fired Don Cherry after that too many men on the ice. You think of Montreal the year before, right? So my rookie year, Fred Craven's our coach. I, I mean, I don't know better. I don't know Don Cherry. I, I don't know coaches, right? So he's my coach. And we're in first place in February. And they fire him. First overall in February. They fire him because the guys could not stand them that had grapes for nine years. This guy was dry, no personality, and just such a different guy than Don Cherry that I did not know. But I, you know, I could see how he was or heard about him, right? But they fired him after, you know, being in first place overall. And then Harry Simmons came in our GM and finished the year as a coach. Yeah, no, I, I remember uh, we weren't that good at Team 85, 86. First coaches meeting on a Saturday night, we're playing in Edmonton. Edmonton Oilers are the best team in the league for the last three, four years. And the pregame speech was, this game is Saturday night, let's get played from one Atlantic to the other. Let's keep it close. <laughs> I'm an 18 year old, you're in the NHL for the first time and you got, that's your raw Rossby's, let's keep it close. Because <laughs> we don't want to be embarrassed on a Saturday night, so that, that was the first one. And the next one, we were actually uh, in a game where we were winning one nothing in Edmonton, which is rare. The, ga the game stalled, the only guy that showed up was Fierzy. Everybody else, I think, was, was out at Barry T's the night before <laughs> in Edmonton, Wayne and Mark. And so our tough guy at the time, I, I'm trying to think, Mike, um, not Big Daddy. Anyways, he's in at the end of the first period because he wants to get in his fight. And so he's putting all the Vaseline on. He's getting ready to go for a fight. And we're like, do not get in a fight. The building is dead. The team doesn't want to play. Do not get in a fight with Dave Semenko. Oh yeah, I, I, I gotta go. <laughs> Dave Semenko beats him up. He wouldn't let him go down. Beats him up from one end of the rink to the other. We lost 8-1. <laughs> do not, and, and the, the thing is when you're a tough guy, if your team's winning, do not start fighting. Do not change the momentum of the game. Do. That was the thing, it's, it's the easiest thing to do is be a tough guy on a winning team. If you don't ever change in the game, the winning team doesn't want the game changed. The worst thing to be is a tough guy on a losing team. Because you're always changing the game. Oh, we're losing 2 nothing. we better go start something. And if somebody wants to start something, well, don't they don't want to start something. So everybody on the other team say, no, we're not fighting. No, we're not going to do that. So then you got to run the goalie over. Or you got to one punch or do something to the team's best player. That sound like shot. Yeah. And so then, it changed because you're trying to change the game to try to get your team in it. And that, that was the role of, of tough guys. The tough guy wasn't, if you got to play in a good team, you didn't have to fight at all because you're always winning. And, and you don't want to change the game because your team's got everything right where you want it. Speaking of tough guys, um, Ray, when you show up in Boston, it's like, I don't know if it's the tail end of the Big Bad Bruins days, but they're still there. I mean, what was your first impression of uh, Terry O'Reilly, because when I look at Wendell, I think he would have been a hell of a room, like Terry O'Reilly at Oh, he was, he would have been there for 20 years, not my, not my Imagine the fans, you and the fans of Boston. You were made for Boston. <laughs> I love Boston, because three, three strides are your team. Well, the three strides are getting the ring. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's what I I, I shoot from the red line, and it was a good shot on that. It was a good shot on that. I, I remember actually asking, I got ready to come back, and we played in New Jersey the night before, and then we were on the flight, and playing in Boston the next night, and I was asking Joe Sackett, so you must hate this. You're getting to go from the biggest rink in New Jersey to the smallest rink in Boston. And he says, no, I love Boston. I beat a guy, I have a scoring chance. He said, I beat a guy in New Jersey by the time I get my scoring chance, the second guy's coming. And so, the, like, and everybody always thinks more ice, bigger ice, and the skill guys want it. Sackett was probably one of the best skill guys I got to play with. And he said, no, I love the small ring. Because I beat a guy, I'm in scoring territory, I get to do something. I play in a great big ring. Somebody has another chance to get me before I get to the scoring chance. Amazing, amazing player and amazing shot. There's, you know what, there's just a couple of guys that could score with the rest of shot from inside the blue line, and Joe was one of them. And the other guy you mentioned, Tom Fergus, 
had a quick rocket for a shot. And I was so sad to see Tom Fergus leave Boston. A young guy like that that has so much potential. Whenever I see Tom Fergus, I'm like, you're such an underachiever. So you could have been a Hall of Famer. He just wants to drill me, but I swear to God, when I saw him show up in Boston, I was so talented. We had Ems Smolenski, uh, Glenn Murray, and they all freaking got traded. And that, that was our future, anyways. But you did ask me about the tough guys when I showed up in Boston. And I showed up in Boston, John Winston, Terrell Riley, that for me, if you look up what's a Boston room in a dictionary, Terrell Riley's picture should be right there. He's the hardest working guy I've ever played with and the toughest guy I've ever played with. This guy was freaking nuts. And, uh, but smart, articulate. The best coach I've ever had was Terry Riley, um, that had never coached before. But Terry was one of the guys, Stamp Jonathan, Al Secord. So I show up, Wensick, O'Reilly, Secord, Jonathan, first exhibition game against, um, the Flyers in Providence, my first exhibition game. John Winston lines up, fights this guy, middle of the ice, and I just hear him hit him right in the face with the punch, and I was like, right. Right. Okay. I'm like, right there, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, not even a year later after that, he tells me, he says, I end up buying his house. You know why I bought it? Because he told me to. <laughs> but you know what? It was uh, it was it was really cool playing on the team. Like you know, they had your backs. You know, and uh, you always felt that we had to be there for them too. And, you know, I remember my second year we go into the game in uh, Detroit, and Drew Chambers is coaching us, and he says. When Obrovnik, John, uh, not Obrovnik, uh, Polonich, when Polonich is on the ice, leave him on the ice. He sucks, he only helps us, I don't want anybody getting the ball with him. But he's chasing O'Reilly all over the place, he wants to fight O'Reilly, right? Taz, Tasmanian Devil, we call him. He was being very smart, very disciplined, but you know, those guys always had my time. So I decided, I'm like, screw this. I'm like, let's go. Leave him right alone. Let's go. So now get into it. Get off to a good start. He gets one in there. And I'm like, oh my freaking god. Now I'm freaking hanging on, and I'm like, whoa. Then I get pissed, and I finish strong, and I'm on top of them. I go to the box. I can't shut my mouth. I'm like this. <laughs> I can put my whole finger in my mouth. I cannot shut my mouth. I am screwed. So now I'm in there for about a minute and a half. Now I like get out of the box. I'm playing with my fist because I hurt my hand, right? Go to the friggin' room, go to the hospital, friggin' broken job, surgery next morning at Mass General. You friggin' slice me up here. No, I'm fucking talking about this. Six weeks like this. Friggin' bring three blenders. I'm friggin' losing 15 pounds. So it'd be great now. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he was a tough little freaking guy, but you know, I, I did pretty good. You know, I, I try to tell people I won that fight, and they still don't believe me. Who won that fight with a broken jaw? Okay, I'm going to geek out a little here, Ray, because there's one guy I loved as a kid, and I don't think enough people talk about him. Um, can you uh, enlighten the crowd on maybe the best goal you ever scored, Rick Middleton score? During your days with him as a girl. Well, I don't. I, I, I can believe how he gets to Canada with no tape on. Yeah, and, and like, no tape on. But Nifty, it was like, you know, I, I just, I just remember getting to Boston and I'm getting dressed for practice and they got, you know, Bobby Moore highlight films and it, it's the music and then Stan Jonathan. Filmed, it's like him kicking the crap out of everybody. Phil Riley, same thing. And then it's Nifty's video, and it's like, and the music is like, oh, it's magic, you know. And then 
and it's like he's, he's just like going through guys, put them through their feet, them to the goalie, and it's, it's like like that will come down on you, and he'll he'll tell 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 the puck's never moved, the puck's out here, and he's just waiting waiting for you to lean to lean. The minute you lean, he makes that move with the puck. He's by you. Um, it might have been. Did he score something crazy in Canada Cup? Like flipped it over a guy's stick, guy's down, or it might have been a Boston, makes a move on a guy, then he flips it over the guy's stick, goes into the goal, and just, yeah. But his shot, you know, his shot was like this, the puck, you know, was going so slow. He had no, no tape on the stick, but this guy should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, amazing player, his numbers up in the rafters, uh, finally, very nice to see that. Uh, but an amazing guy and uh, just an amazing player. And one that uh, really helped me uh, in my leadership role with the Bruins. I was asked to be captain of the Bruins when I was 25, 26. And, you know, leader on the ice and practice, doing my job and all that stuff, no problem. Then they asked me to be captain. And, you know, when the crap hits the fan, when you're a captain, you got to run with meetings and all this stuff, and I was a quiet, shy kid. I really didn't feel comfortable with all that stuff, and Rick Middleton was on our team, and Taz had just retired, and uh, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was ready to be captain, and <coughs> the Bruins really wanted me to be captain. So that, I said, well, Rick's the I thought Rick was going to be the next guy in line, so they they kind of came up with, what about if Rick Middleton and you share the captaincy? So we did that for two years, and that allowed me to kind of feel comfortable into that next leadership role. So um, it was it was a blast playing with Rick, and uh, to this day we you know we see each other a lot. And he's an amazing guy, and uh, he's doing good things in Boston. Well, tell them there's a slightly overweight sportscaster in Canada who loves playing awesome. <laughs> Um I'm not talking about me. <laughs> okay, um, it's 13 days till the NHL season starts, okay? Uh, most teams have played two preseason games so far. Players show up in shape. They're going to leave the rink tonight and have their, I don't know, protein shape. It's 1988 and it's 13 days until the season. What are you guys doing? <clears throat> First three weeks is two a day. <laughs> so you have two days for the first three weeks, and then you start getting into the games, and then you're praying that you're in the game because you don't have to do the two days still, and because they keep that was the difference. The best thing that ever came with the player association is one a day skates, and you start playing right away. Uh, they, these guys, like the Leafs, started camp two days later. They played the first game in Montreal. We were three weeks of two days before we even see a game. Hence why guys didn't really come to camp and shape as much. The old guys, though, I'm going to be on the team. I'm going to skate two a days for a month. I'll be in shape when the season starts. Because our days in training camp, the guy who won the fitness test was always the first cop. Because odds are he just trained and he wasn't very good anyway. <laughs> and so the first days of training camp, all the guys that never played the team, and as you get to the end of training camp, all the veterans, all of a sudden, they're doing all the stuff. They're the best players. And, and, and all the guys that started out really good, they're really not that good anyway. They were just in peak form because they're trying to make the camp. Anyway, so go, going into, like, these guys right now, they're, they're in, in great shape. I right? forget what the Leafs started doing 15, 20 years ago. The team gets about two weeks off after the season, then they start training. My program was, if the Edmonton Oilers are still winning the Cup in mid-June, I'm not training. <laughs> if they're not training, I'm not training. So really, we didn't really start till July 1st. And then you kind of get going. These guys, and, and we have to be losing out fairly early in the last eight years, they're starting their program third week or May 1st. These guys are already back doing their routines. Uh, where we weren't um, doing that till July 1st. So these guys are in, in pretty peak form. Then year round, these guys are year round athletes now. They don't really uh, tone it down. They have their own their own guys. So they're they're pretty much ready to play. But the one thing that's still kind of the same is the best players aren't going to have their best games in exhibition. 
you're still just trying to feel a puck, get get your legs going, get your head in the game, and then when October 11th comes around, I'm ready to play. That's when they're ready to play. The rookies on the team, they want to get the four points, and they want to have the biggest game run, because they have to keep impressing all the brass. For the best players that know all the, they're on the team, they're just making sure they're ready for, for October. So all the best players on all the teams now are just kind of getting their head around uh, playing the game and, and, and ready to play when the season starts. Who had the worst eating habits of anyone you ever played with, guys? Us? Yeah? <laughs> Us. Yeah? <laughs> no, I, I don't know if the uh, worst, our, our, like today's players, like boss is probably the same way. You have a two million, a two million dollar kitchen in the least, oh my God. in the least practice ring. Yeah. And boss is probably the same thing. Two full time chefs, so they get there in the morning, and it's like you're ordering. Like I used to live across the street from the uh, Scotia Bank, and I go down every morning skate because as they were going on the ice, people were thinking, why aren't you going to watch? Well, no, then I get to go to talk to the chef. I'll have two eggs easy over the extra bacon, <laughs> full meal to start, and that's the breakfast of these guys every morning, and then they're getting meals to take home. Like, they're getting perfect meals. The wines have it pretty good now. Yeah, yeah <laughs> They don't have to cook breakfast, they don't have to cook a pre-game meal, and even after the game, they have their, their they get, meals. They get, they get all meals. For our day, I, I, I don't know if it was Kenny Reagan's car, might have been LA for any star, big hour. The back seat was full of Mickey D's bags. <laughs> Basically, Mac, that's where all the young guys, I thought when I first made the NHL, I thought like Wendy's was a step up because you had a baked potato. <laughs> and that, but that's really, as young guys, you're coming out of high school, and now you're going into all these cities and it's fast, you're still a kid, so you're still in the fast food, and, and guys start getting run down. And Ray would have noticed it a little more than me started earlier. The, we had no pregame meal, pregame meals in New York City. So when we were on our own in New York to get a pregame meal, so in New York we always seem to play there Sundays. Nothing's open unless you you had to go to the hotel or find a spot. And, and so you're so lots of guys had McDonald's before our night game playing against the Rangers. Like just to say the diets of guys in the old days was off. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons is in pro sports today. Because you're dealing with young players and young athletes and they're not going to do a lot of the things unless it's easy. That's just kids. So the player, the teams take it out of the player's hands. There is no excuses. We're going to make sure you eat right, you have everything you need, you have the right sticks, the right skates, right? So when you don't play well, it is on you. It isn't because we didn't do everything we could for you. Uh, these, these athletes today. But also when you're recruiting players for free agency, you got to have the perfect setup. You know, you got to have the, the facilities for them to train. Uh, you got to have the setup for the males. Uh, you got to have the setup for the wives. The more you have to offer, now the better chance you have to get some free agents. And whenever comes a time that you know you can convince them that your place is the best place to come play. <laughs> Patrick also about McDonald's. <laughs> Don't tell them I told you that. Uh, Wendell, you had you played for one of the most notorious owners ever in Harold Ballard. Um, can you tell us about Harold maybe going into your dressing room and showering and blow drying his hair? No. Well, I went to Russ Cortland and I thought we were getting sent to the minors. But we were back in the trainer's room, which is the back of the dressing room. The owner, Harold Ballard, come in to look in the mirror. He picks up the blow dryer. It's now full, set up for practice. We've set up the blow dryers full of baby powder. Whoever is the next morning. So the owner turns on the baby, boof, baby powder everywhere. So then he's grabbing a towel to wipe the baby powder off. Well, you put the Vaseline in the white towel. So the guy who's got the Vaseline is a herald, and he thinks it's the best. We thought we were done, he because he got to be one of the players. He, he, like, he thought that was great. <laughs> then you'd be playing on a Saturday night in Toronto, and you go back to go in the trainer's room, and the door's locked. The back of the trainer's room is where the hot tub and cold tub were. And you couldn't get in because the door's locked. Well, Harold used to go in, and they'd have a 2 by 12 plank they'd put across the hot tub so he could sit 
and put his feet in because he had diabetes, so he had to keep the circulation in his feet. He fell in. <laughs> so he had all our training staff and the team doctors trying to get the owner out of the hot tub. So he's drowning. So we were saying, just hold the motor a little longer. <laughs> and so, that, so you guys are all looking at warm up, perfect Boston jerseys, perfect blue and white leaf jerseys, camera lights, everything must be perfect. And this chaos is going on in the dressing room. Underneath, and the players are getting ready to go, and Harold's drowning in the hot tub. <laughs> and, and so all these little antics would be going on. And, and Harold was really hated. He liked to do, the older he got, when King Clancy passed away, that was pretty much the, did the switch for, for Harold because there was nobody else in his era that, that he would trust. And, and he was getting up there and, and was still running the team, but wasn't. And so he'd do antics just to create it. Like he, when I was out, I missed 100 games with a back injury. He would tell the media that I was lazy and didn't want to play. And on his way back in, he'd say, I don't care what you do. I just go back and be healthy. But that's not a story in the media. So he'd just go and tell the media stuff. He never thought that. And, and, and so he was just about stirring the pot. Harold was the first guy that took the gray, top half of the grays out of the gardens and put in boxes. And he got cut up in the media because he's taken away so many seats. Meanwhile, he put in boxes he could charge 10 times more for versus the cheapest seat in the building. Like he was ahead of a lot doing little things. He used to own the Hamilton Tiger Cats <coughs> just to piss off the Toronto Argos. <laughs> so he put the Hamilton Tiger Cat banner behind the visiting dress team bench because the camera over the penalty box kept panning by <laughs> leaf bench, visiting bench, so he kept seeing Tiger Cats all the time. So he did all these things just, and that was his fun and, and sitting in that bunker and in, in today's game Harold would have been a little guy Harold wasn't that well off in today's days of owners he he, he, he wasn't that well off at all uh, but he was the big guy he owned one of the original six teams team city's always full um, but I, I was a young kid in the 80s so if you're so happy to be there you don't understand how bad you're being run now if you're uh, Boria Salming and Rick Vibe and Daryl Sittler that lived it through that, they see it. So they have a, a little different understanding because they've now lived it for 10 years. They understand good and bad. Where I knew 18 years old, you're just happy to be there. We were losing the game. We lost, actually lost the game. We lost the playoffs to St. Louis. We're coming back and Harold has the diabetes. So he's got a thermostat of about 95 on the airplane. So we're sitting in the nude and he's going back in the airplane and, and my first year King Clancy had come back and told uh, the staff that the next old guy on behind me make sure he doesn't get any chocolate he's a diabetic so they wouldn't let him have any chocolate bars so he fired that we had to fly commercial after that he fired the plane because they wouldn't get chocolate bars on the plane that's and so that's, that, that was Harold and I don't know if he'd get away with it today he had to go to the washing lot so a lot of times he'd be on the airplane and he'd say, Clarky, open the thing. I'd sit in the back row, I'd open the bathroom door, he'd get about halfway back, don't worry, I already went. He'd turn around and walk back to the front because he couldn't make it back. <laughs> or imagine Pearson Airport today. You're out there, you're flying somewhere else and you're looking and there's the owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs taking a whiz on the front tire of the airplane as the team's getting on. <laughs> 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 he just, when he had to go, we had to go. That, that was, that was Harold and, and, and you're not there yet. No, I'm not <laughs> um, and yeah, things are different now. Um, getting into the final ones, but Ray, what was it like playing for the Bruins after the circus would come to town? Because that was an annual thing for you guys in the garden, right? Smell People are down to their dinners, so. No bad, oh my god. You you know, the old garden we'd, uh, we'd park our cars, we'd go up the ramp and then we'd park our cars and that's where they you know, they kept the elephants and all this stuff for, you know, they were probably in there for at least a week, if not two or ten days. And that friggin' thing smelled like forever, forever. Um, and then, you know, the ice wasn't you know, far from perfect, but what are you looking for here? Well, people are it's done just dessert, a so. Yeah. 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 Um, how about, how about if we tell a couple of stories? Do it. We'll tell a couple of stories. Okay. Um, I was telling this story earlier to, uh, is it uh, Langer? 
he, uh, okay. So he, he, wrote, he wrote a book about uh, your first, what, your first day with the cop? Yeah. Is that it? You like that plug? Thank you. Okay. Jim Lang. <laughs> Jim Lang. Um, and I was telling him about my first day with the cop. And uh, it was in 2001 when I went to come to Colorado. And, um, so I go, I go to Colorado uh, March 6th of 2000. We go to the semifinals, lose to Dallas in the seventh game. I know I'm going back for another year. But I know it's one year. I just want to sign a one year deal. I tell Pierre Lefouin, that's going into the Hall of Fame this year, very well deserved. Um, and uh, I tell him, I just want the same deal as I had last year, give me a one year deal. He says, no, I'm, I'm giving you a two year deal. I'm like, yeah, well, one year. I mean, I was making six million at the time. I said, give me the same deal. And uh, he said, no, I'm going to give you five million, and I'm going to give you six the second year. And if you don't play the second year, you'll have to, I'll give you a million, and it'll be nice perfect. There we go. But going into that year, I tell my wife, I said, this is it, regardless of what happens, that's it. So we have an amazing year. We won the President's Trophy, better, best goals against. Patrick beats the record for most wins by a goalie. Uh, Joe wins the Hart Trophy, and just an amazing year. So um, we get to the finals, and we're playing New Jersey, and you know, we win game one, lose game two, win game three, lose game four, go back home for game five. We get pretty blown out in that game. Now we're down 3-2, going to New Jersey, defending champs. Nobody's given us a chance to win that game. Well, like I said, this is my last year playing. So it's an amazing feeling knowing that, you know, this may be my last game. Hoping that it's not, but the last practice and your rank, your practice rank, you fly to New Jersey, the morning skate, might be your last morning skate, last pre-game meal, last pre-game nap, uh, you can't sleep too much. But I want my family there. My kids, my wife are there, my dad, my siblings are there, my wife's siblings are there, her dad is there, and my best friends are there. We went for nothing. Now I bring everybody to Colorado knowing that this is my last game. It's an amazing feeling that you know you're taking everything in and just knowing that, you know, this is it. And uh, I wanted people that were for my life to be there. And um, we went on to win the cup, had an amazing celebration after the game. We go to the chop house after the game across from the Pepsi Center. And then at the end of the night, around 2 30 in the morning, Pierre Lacroix, the GM, says, Bring a cup home with you. I'm like, awesome. I rented this big 15 passenger red van to drive everybody around. And I have a big cooler in there. And now I'm like, Screw this. I said, Everybody at my house. So we drive to my house about 20, 25 minutes out, turn on my street, start beeping the horn. People are coming out of their house. We put the cup on the sidewalk, the cool in the street. We're there until about 5.30 in the morning. It was amazing, first experience with the cop. And too bad it's a nice story, but <laughs> your next book. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know what, I, you know, I own the record for most points by a defenseman and all that stuff, and you know, it's never talked about. Um, you know, the guy's gonna have to score 80 points or pretty much 100 points for, you know, 15 years to break it. It won't be broken in a while. But the thing that comes up, what people remember the most about my career has nothing to do with scoring a goal or an assist, especially in Boston. So I go to camp my first year. I'm our number 29 in training camp. And I show up for the first game, and number seven is in my stall. Phil Esposito's number. And again, I'm a shy kid, I don't say nothing. I get dressed, put my jersey on. Bobby Schmantz, a veteran, comes over. He says, if you hear any antlers, don't worry about it, just play your game. And I'm like, all right. Don't hear nothing, because I, you know, I went over the year, I got 65 points, 17 goals, 
first team all-star, had an amazing first year. And the only thing that I heard was when the press would ask me, what do you think about the number being retired? It was Phil Esposito's number. I'm like, Ledger won two cups, one of the best players of all time in hockey, of course. It should be, you know, I'm like, yeah, it's a no-brainer, right? Well, Harry was so pissed at Phil when they when they traded, Phil was pissed at Harry. They were kind of like in a feud, so Harry was pissed, gave me the number. Now I'm wearing it until 1987, December 3rd, 1987, they decide to retire his number. Awesome. Nothing was said what was going to happen with the number until 1 o'clock, December 3rd. I mean, when you talk about dinosaurs and how a lack of communication and how there's no communication, you know, no planning, no nothing. I got a call at 1 o'clock that afternoon. Terry Riley was coaching our team. He said, I'm sitting in Harry's office. We're kind of wondering what we should do with the number. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm like, guys, come on. I mean, it's, it's got to go up. You know, just, just put another seven on my jersey. I'll become number 77. So what we did, I came to the game. I picked up Keith Crowder and Glenn Wesley, driving into the game, didn't say a word. I go out for warm up with number seven. I come back in the room. I go in the back room, the trainer's room, put number 77 under number seven, I put number seven. Now we go out for the room, go out for the game. We call Phyllis Pesito up. I reveal number 77 and give Phil my number seven. Now it goes up to the rafters. I mean, the building only held 14,500. There must have been a friggin' 100,000 people at that game because everybody I run into in Boston talks about that day and that, that move was, uh, was amazing. Seeing Phyllis Pizzillo's face where, you know, I jokingly say it, but it's true. The first time that Phyllis Pizzillo was ever speechless was that night. Uh, it was an amazing night. No press, no teammates, nobody knew other than management trainers and my wife. And uh, it was just a great night making, uh, you know, making Phil, you know, feel the way he, he should have felt. And that number should have never been given to anybody else and Phil was just, you know. Rick Five, our captain, was 22. I got here and offered him a Timex. <laughs> I think Rolex was the going rate to get the number. But 350 goals, he's, he's not giving up. So actually, when I got to, to the lease, number 17 was hanging in the stall. That's how I, I got the number. Um, I, I can't see you with any other number. I mean, what a perfect number, though. Don't you think? Well, it's okay now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, what, what moment from the Leafs do people ask you most about? Uh, it's generally, now that there's, the hockey's changed so much, it's weird. When I first retired and the game was still really tough, it was all about anything but fighting. And now that the game has zero fighting, everything goes back to fighting because it's the one thing you don't see anymore. So they're always going back, and you know, I have to remind people that I, I really didn't start out that way. But it, I, I kept doing it. But that's how, how people, because you don't see it anymore, they want to talk about it now. And even players in the dressing room, you watch current players watch old days hockey, and they just shake their head. Like, why would you do that? Or even like, and, well, Ray was saying it when he played, but Ray was one of the best two-way players that ever played. But the, uh, really the, the things of, of just playing the game, getting a chance to play in the NHL, we're so honored. Uh, to play as long as we did, whatever you could. And it didn't matter the city you played in, the, the people you meet in the game. And the best thing now is, is being retired and running into different people from different eras or, or different alumni or from different teams. We all have the same things in common. I mean, we tell our current players today, I said, we're, you're going to be us. 
and you're going to do the same things. We're we're their biggest fans. We're not critics of our guys that are playing because we want them to do well as our home team. Uh, my job in the building is to talk about the team, and it's a way more fun talking when we're winning and, and them doing well. And, and so just the the whole game and getting a chance. I can trade it again. Trade it again. You gotta turn it on. Maybe that was my problem. I never turned the light on. Can I just say something that you you, you kind of alluded to? Where you know now we run into a lot of the alumni that we played against, and uh, we we just have a blast. And I've got to say, for me, it's and, and for you, it's. It's, it's really thanking Andrew Jackson that is a big part of this night and so many other nights, but the events that he puts on allows us to get together and, you know, it could be an ex-teammate, it could be, it could be Clark that I played against for, you know, for many years, but we just have a blast doing this and being out and talking hockey and being part of raising money for great causes and, you know, I mean, they put so many events on a year and, He's my guy here in Canada, and I know I'm not sure to see you too much. Yeah. <laughs> Is it nice to see Wendell without him trying to get you? It's always nice. I believe me, I you have to keep your eyes open for him because he's a freaking tank, and all of a sudden they, they pop up. He's not the tallest guy. All of a sudden, oh my God! And you, you're lucky if you could just avoid him because if he got to you, whoa, watch out. And if you ever had to fight him, the bomb was coming from way down, and if he caught you, you were going down. <laughs> you guys never went though, eh? No, come on. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody, give it up for Ray White. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Here's the deal. We've got uh, silent auction until nine. We've got our wheel for the. Uh,